Bernard Lewis is one of our most respected historians and lately one of our best known. He is a professor emeritus in Near Eastern Studies at Princeton. He has written more than 20 books on the subject of the Middle East. His most recent book entitled What Went Wrong has been on the bestseller list for more than two months. Since September 11th, a number of leaders have sought his expertise and his historical judgment, including members of the Bush administration. He recently turned from a trip to the Middle East where he gave a series of lectures. I'm always pleased to have him on this program and especially now. Welcome back. Thank you. Delighted where have you be been here. traveling? That's my question. Well, since we last met, mm -hmm. I have been to um, Turkey, Jordan, Israel, and a brief stop on the way home, Italy. Uh, and what have you learned? And, and what, did, uh, what searing impressions uh, that come to you on the basis of this sort of extraordinary hist historical perspective that you have? Well, the most interesting by far, I should say, in the sense that it was really something new, was the meeting in Istanbul. This was a, they called it a forum convened by the Turkish government of the European Union and the Organization of the Islamic Conference. That's to say two large organizations invited to participate at foreign minister level. Mm -hmm. So we had at this gathering more than 40 ministers of foreign affairs, including uh, Vedrin, Joshka Fisher, Jack Straw, and all the others mm -hmm. from Europe, right. and their opposite numbers from Iran, from Egypt, from Saudi Arabia, and elsewhere. Um, and it was an extremely interesting gathering. Um, I think perhaps more because of what didn't happen than because of what did happen. What didn't happen? Well, this was a gathering, as I said, of two large bodies. And um, there were people, naturally, who wanted to exploit this for a variety of purposes. Um, I was not, I was there as a, what they called an independent expert. They had a small group of people, about half a dozen, who were not foreign ministers and did not come from either the Organization of the Islamic Conference or the um, European Union. And I was there as, as a historian of the region, as a specialist, one or two others in the same capacity. And uh, the session at which I was asked to speak, I shared the podium with another professor, an Egyptian from Cairo, and with two ministers of foreign affairs uh, from Egypt and from Iran. And uh, I took the opportunity to make what I thought was a, a necessary point. I said, here we have a gathering of two great organizations, one defined by a religion, the other defined by a continent. I said, I hope that in your search for common ground, you will not seek it in a shared rancor against another continent or a shared prejudice against another religion. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I, I didn't yeah. specify, but I think they got my meaning. Yeah, I think I do too. <laughs> and uh, it's interesting, I learned afterwards that there were attempts to do precisely that. Yeah. Um, from more, and this again will not surprise you, more from the European side than from the Islamic side. Yes. And why is that? I mean, what is the European problem? It's a difficult question to answer, but I think the, the simplest and most direct answer I could give you is that it's the, the sense of having been outpaced, outperformed, superseded. And this comes, this is very difficult to accept for a, a region that has for centuries regarded itself with some justification as the forefront of civilization. And um, by the way, I think one has to add that Europe is by no means unanimous on this or anything else. In dealing with the outside world, they try as far as possible to present a united front. But um, it was quite clear that there were very serious differences between the Europeans on various issues, particularly those that we were there to discuss. I mean, for example, there was an attempt to present what they called uh, a European approach to the problems of the Middle East in general and the Arab-Israel conflict in particular. And this was intended, I think it's not unfair to say, more to spite the United States than to help the Middle Easterners. And this was supported by some Europeans, but was effectively spiked by others. What ought to be the appropriate approach to finding some means, some arrangement for creating a Palestinian state and creating security for the Israeli state. Yes. 
I think these are legitimate, indeed obvious, objectives. I think that most people now would agree that a Palestinian state is an essential part of the solution, whatever that solution may be, with the exception perhaps of the extreme right in Israel. The, the difference is that um, between those who want a Palestinian state alongside Israel and those who want a Palestinian state in place of Israel. So the real question that the Palestinians have to decide <clears throat> is whether they are prepared to coexist with an Israeli state and recognize not only its existence but its legitimacy, or whether they are going to insist on carrying on their campaign in whatever form may seem appropriate until Israel is eliminated and a Palestinian state is established, as Faisal Husseini put it shortly before he died, from the river to the sea. He was in favor of that? Faisal Husseini yes, was, who he, was sort of the PLO's man in, he was in Jerusalem. He was the PLO's man in Jerusalem, and uh, he was generally rather cautious. And, and generally considered to be a moderate. Exactly, but shortly before he died, he made a speech in which he did articulate this as the ultimate objective. A speech in Arabic? In Arabic, yes. To, to what a, organization? Uh, to what I'm group. afraid I don't know. I, others have said what you just said here, uh, n none perhaps as eloquently as you have said it, and, and based on the contacts that you have. So what does that mean? It is very difficult to measure opinion, because remember that uh, we are dealing with a society in which there is no freedom of speech, in which expressing unpopular opinions can have very painful, indeed terminal, consequences. And therefore, in order to get to know what people are really thinking, you have to develop a kind of informal, personal relationship with people and when they know you well enough and trust you, they may say what they really think. Otherwise, it's very difficult. I mean, the press, the media generally, express almost uniformly uh, an idea that Israel must be eliminated, that Israel is an alien intrusion into the region, that its very existence is an act of aggression. I assume you're not just talking about the Palestinian press, we're talking about the press in Egypt, in Saudi Arabia, in um, Iran, in Iraq. Well, in I'm speaking more particularly of the Palestinian press and media and even school books and things like that. It's quite clear that any arrangement would be regarded as temporary, uh, the starting point for the next round, so to speak. In the Arab world generally, there have been changes. Um, there have been periods when there seem to be some willingness for an accommodation. But latterly, of course, since during the last few weeks, that has got worse and worse. And the, um, uh, the willingness to compromise seems to have disappeared. Does that then make that the Sharon initiative of the Israeli Defense Forces into these territories uh, to get at the terrorist infrastructure, as Sharon says, unwise? because it is generating a change in opinion within the Palestinian community that mm -hmm. does not want Well, the, the change to began side with the side. suicide bombers. I mean, it didn't begin with Sharon invading the territories. Uh, I'm not showing where it began, but I'm saying the consequences for the Palestinians is more seen through uh, the yes. presence of the Israeli forces yes. in well, the I, occupied territories. I have a territory. somewhat different explanation to offer. Okay. Um, that is that all this is a consequence of President Bush's war against terrorism. He announced not long ago that he was preparing to wage a, an unremitting struggle against what he called the axis of evil and that uh, there would be a war against terrorism. Um, it has been suggested, and I think there's a, uh, this is to say the very least plausible, that this is a maneuver to deflect that war against terrorism that the recent intensification of activity was sponsored by Iraq and to a lesser extent Iran and we do know that they have both been actively involved in the recent terrorist activities and that its purpose is to confuse the issue and to deflect the war against terrorism that is against themselves and if that is the correct explanation I think that they have been very successful in that maneuver they have succeeded in muddying the issue and deflecting the war against terrorism. And apparently thwarted Bush administration's immediate efforts to change the regime in Iraq. Exactly. And uh, I have no doubt that that was uh, one of Saddam Hussein's purposes. Yeah, but surely you don't believe, perhaps you do, because you just said it, that in fact that the present level of hostility and the number of suicide bombers mm -hmm. has been given birth and encouragement and motivation from Iraq and Iran 
and and the radical the radical element in Iran and mm. Saddam Hussein yeah. government. Well, let's look at the history of the last ten years. Uh, remember that um, Israel had been in occupation of these territories since 1967, and on the whole, it was a fairly smooth and even peaceful occupation in the early years. That's to say, um, in the late 60s and early 70s, I was astonished at the relaxed and peaceful atmosphere in the occupied territories at that time with easygoing social commun and economic communication between the different parties. I was puzzled by this and I made my own inquiries. This would have been, as I said, in the early 70s. And I think I found the reason why the people of the occupied territories were so acquiescent in the Israeli presence. The reason I think was this. The Israelis were nobody's first choice, but they were everybody's second choice. Opinion was divided among the Palestinians between the supporters of the Royal Jordanian establishment, which had previously ruled those territories mm. until the Israelis conquered them in 67, and supporters of the PLO, at that time still in Beirut. And both had very strong feelings about the other. If you spoke to supporters of the Royal Jordanians, they would say, well, uh, we, would rather be, we would rather be ruled by the Royal Jordanians, but it's better to be ruled by the Israelis than by these gangsters from Beirut. No love lost there. No. On the other hand, if you spoke to the supporters of the PLO, they would say, well, we would like to have the PLO come and establish a Palestinian state. But if that doesn't happen, or until that happens, we would rather be ruled by the Israelis than by the Royal Jordanians. Now, why is that on because the Because the Royal Jordanians, they say, shot us down like dogs in the streets in the so-called Black September events of 1970. When that King left, Hussein turned against them. Well, I think in fairness, one should say they turned against King Hussein. Okay, fair enough. But I mean, They tried to take over the kingdom. Uh, agreed, but he made a decision that he, he could no decision. longer tolerate them. Yes. That's my point. Yes, I mean, they did bombard the palace and try to take over the exactly. country. And uh, he suppressed it, shall we say, with the utmost severity, so that a lot of them escaped into Israel-occupied territories. Mm -hmm. So you had these two groups, the supporters of the PLO, who said, rather than the Israelis, rather the Israelis than the Royal Jordanians, and you had the supporters of the Royal Jordanians, who said, rather the Israelis than the PLO. Now, what changed that was the change of government in Israel in 77, with a Likud government coming into power. And their line was much more strongly, uh, how shall I put it, nationalist. They made it clear that, in their view, this was not just a temporary occupation. Uh, they began the policy of settlements and expansion within the territories. And that caused real alarm among the Palestinians, which is understandable. But even then, it remained fairly peaceful with really quite extensive economic relations. This was the government of Menachem Begin? Yes. And his successors. Okay. Shamir. Yes. Um, that, that was where the business of settlements and changing the borders began. Until then it was simply occupation, occupied territory and administered as such. Well then um, came the f collapse of the Soviet Union. Now the, the Arabs, the Palestinians, very naturally, turned to the enemies of their enemies. Uh, their fight had been against the British Empire and the Jews, and so they accepted the support of the Third Reich, and after the disappearance of the Third Reich, they accepted the support of the Soviet Union. Um, as I say, very naturally, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Well then, in about 10 years ago, the situation was dramatically changed. The Soviet Union disappeared. And there was, uh, and the PLO, Palestinian leadership, found itself in a very parlous position. Their superpower patron had collapsed. They had also made the great mistake of identifying themselves with Saddam Hussein. In the Gulf War. In the Gulf War, so that they had antagonized their main Arab supporters and paymasters. So they were isolated, impoverished, and enfeebled. Now, at that time, the government of Israel made the decision to throw a life belt. They, they brought Arafat to these discussions in Oslo and... Uh, Madrid first. Uh, Madrid first and then Oslo. Well, Madrid was an American initiative. Um, the Oslo, Baker administration, yes. I mean, not Baker administration, but Secretary Baker. Yes. The, um, the Oslo conversations, the direct bilateral conversations, right. that was Israeli-Palestinian. 
and um, things were going quite well to start with. They even brought the, PL, the Arafat and the PLO leadership from Tunisia, where they had been exiled. They brought them back to Palestine, set them up, provided them with an infrastructure, provided them even with weapons for their security forces, and everything seemed to be going swimmingly. Um, if I may borrow a phrase from myself, what went wrong? <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, uh, <laughs> You're the only person who's ever done that who wasn't, in fact, trying to promote their book. Well, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> the book has nothing whatever to do with that. I know, I, mean, I, know, I understand. That's why uh, I said it. That, that's uh, the phrase where the phrase yes. is. Go ahead. Uh, well, so, I, did, so I didn't invent the phrase. <laughs> <laughs> it's an apt phrase for that book. Yes. And, and an apt phrase for the consideration the you're asking. Of what went wrong. Now, this is a very interesting question, and I think one can examine it from various points. It is very easy to blame one side or the other for not being sufficiently um, accommodating, not being sufficiently generous, whichever side you look at. But I don't think that that is the answer. I have two answers which are not mutually exclusive. One of them is, I think, a misreading of the past which gave rise to dangerous delusions about the present. When I speak of the past, I'm speaking of the famous peace between Begin and Sadat, which led to a peace treaty between Israel and Egypt. Uh, now, the popular mythology is that Sadat made this enormously courageous and imaginative gesture of offering peace, and expressing his willingness even to go to Jerusalem. They then went to the United States to discuss it further, and thanks to the wise statesmanship of Jimmy Carter and his staff, they were able to bring it to a successful conclusion to a peace treaty. The historical truth is somewhat different. The thing began with very secret bilateral negotiations between the two sides, between Begin and Sadat. They were helped not as mediators, but as facilitators by the King of Morocco and the late Ceausescu of Romania. Uh, unlike, uh, Ceausescu. Unlikely as that Unlikely might be. Unlikely partners, <laughs> but nevertheless. Yeah. Ceausescu, uh, Romania was the only one of the Soviet bloc countries which did not break off diplomatic relations with Israel, but maintained some sort of contact. And that enabled him to do this. These negotiations, as I said, were totally secret and totally bilateral, with facilitators, not negotiators, providing places for them to meet and, and the necessary cover. When Sadat made his famous declaration, virtually everything had been agreed between them. Sadat knew exactly what the terms were, what he was going to get, what he would have to give. Why did they go public? Well, obviously, they needed someone to pay the bill. And who but the United States to fulfill that function? Uh, so they went public with it, and they came with, uh, uh, with drums and fifes and <laughs> accompanying music <laughs> to Washington. And, uh, and headed for Camp David. And headed for Camp David, uh, dealing this time not with a facilitator but with a mediator. It nearly went wrong. I mean, this kind of mediation can easily go wrong. And there were dangerous moments when... Uh, and shall we say the role of the mediator was less positive than one might think, they're no doubt well-intentioned. But Begin and Sadat had substantially agreed on everything, and they brought it to a successful conclusion. Now, the mythology arising from that, I think, was very dangerous, because it led people to say, well, we must do the same. Oslo began, as the Egyptian-Israeli negotiations began, with totally secret bilateral negotiations. The Norwegians acted as facilitators. They played the role of the King of Morocco and Ceausescu. They did not mediate. But where they went wrong was, I think, was first in going public too soon, before they had really reached effective agreement, and second in bringing in President Clinton as mediator. Now, I'm not blaming President Clinton for what went wrong. What I'm saying was that it was too soon to go public, and it was a great mistake to bring in a mediator who happened to be the President of the United States because with such a mediator, they stop negotiating with each other. They begin negotiating with the mediator, and each tries to get advantage in those terms. That, shall we say, certainly put a crimp on the negotiations and on the peace process. So it but became a triangle rather than a it bilateral. It became a triangle rather than a bilateral, and I think that was not a good thing, because each was trying to score points with the media. Before you go any further, let me just clear up one thing for my own benefit. Mm. You, are you saying that there was a mythology that came out of Begin Sadat? Yes. And I the think. mythology was that what? 
The mythology was that Sadat, without any preparatory work, made this ah, okay. bold and uh, incredibly courageous yeah. uh, declaration. And then, thanks to the wise statesmanship of President Carter and his staff, they were able okay. to bring it to a successful And, and the point is, there's a long uh, yeah. preparation. I don't and, wish to and facilitation diminish before they the got contribution there. of President Carter yeah. and his uh, and his staff, but nevertheless, the main work was done before they went public. Right. Um, I remember vividly when um, Sadat made his declaration. I was in Washington, and I happened to be visiting someone in the White House, and I know that they were totally surprised by it. They had absolutely no knowledge whatsoever of secret negotiations between the two parties. They were very surprised and even somewhat alarmed. Yeah. And then gradually things changed, as you know. Well, that was, I think, the first great mistake. Now, the second mistake is, as I'm a little less certain about, but I'm fairly, fairly sure, and that is the role of Arafat. Now, here you have things going fairly well. Uh, Arafat has been brought back. The Palestine Authority has been set up with Israeli help and support and even quite substantial financial help from Israel because an arrangement was made whereby Israel collected taxes, income tax, for Palestinian workers in Israel and then remitted that money to the Palestinian Authority, which ran into millions. Um, there was also uh, a good deal of what you might call normal economic exchange between the two sides. Uh, a lot of Israelis preferred to do their shopping in the Palestine territories because it was cheaper, the prices were lower. Um, there was the famous uh, casino in Jericho where Israelis went to gamble and no doubt lost a lot of money. <laughs> um, many other activities of this kind, all kinds of economic activities, so that things were beginning to look much better. There was economic development uh, in the territories and uh, a growing sort of network of interactions of various kinds, people buying and selling both ways. A lot of the exports of the territories went to Israel or through Israel to the outside world and so on and so on. Then things began to go wrong. <clears throat> and this, this is the point where interpretations differ. Now, the crucial point, I think, was the offer made by then Prime Minister Barak to Arafat. Um, now, some people will tell you that this was an extremely generous offer, that he was offering more than any Israeli leader had ever before offered even including compromises on Jerusalem. That is the conventional wisdom. That is the conventional wisdom. And I think there's a lot to support that. On the Palestinian side, you will, or by sympathizers with the Palestinian side, you will be told that it was not a good offer, that it was hedged around with all sorts of restraints and restrictions, that it wasn't sincere, that Barak was bluffing, and so on and so on and so on. I remember when I was in Turkey at this meeting, I mentioned to you one of the foreign ministers from a Muslim country said, well, he said, I must admit that Arafat made a bad mistake in rejecting Barak's offer. So I said, and I repeat what I said to him, I said, with respect, that is not the point. In a negotiation between two parties, Arafat was perfectly entitled to reject the offer. Uh, you may think it is a good offer, I may think it was a good offer, but if he didn't think it was a good offer, he's entitled to reject it. But in that case, the appropriate course would be to make a counter-offer, to make a counter-proposal, not break off negotiations and launch an armed insurrection. Um, that and, and just for history's sake, are you saying that happened after Taba? Uh, yes, that there was no, yes, even I, through Taba, there was no counter-offer by Arafat to whatever the no, nature of Barack's no, proposal there, was. There was, there was no counter-offer. It, it was simply a break in the negotiations. And uh, a resumption of armed violence. And, and Barack had some domestic political pressures. And, yeah, but and that had deadline. nothing to do with it. Okay. Bar uh, Barack certainly had pressures. I mean, every prime minister of Israel has domestic know, pressures. But he had election, didn't he, uh, coming up? Yes, um, which, uh, which Arafat lost for him. Right. I mean, Arafat exactly. brought Sharon to power. But anyway, coming back to the point I'm making. Now, uh, the question inevitably arises, what did Arafat think he was doing? Um, in not making a counteroffer. In not making a counteroffer. Things had been going relatively well, and if you're made a good offer, then surely the natural thing to do is to uh, try and get a better offer, which he might even have been able to get because things were trending in that, tending in that direction. Mm -hmm. Instead of which, he breaks off negotiations and launches, as I said, an armed insurrection. 
And one is irresistibly driven to the conclusion that he didn't want peace and that the reason he rejected Barak's offer was that there was a serious danger that peace might break out. Um, uh, try to look at it in a different perspective. Um, Arafat was a terrorist. He had been all his life a terrorist. This was the only thing in which he really excelled. And remember, this is the man of the Munich Olympics, the Achille Lauro, the embassy murders in Khartoum, and various other things, the hijackings. And um, this was what he knew very well. Now, and of which he was very good. He was a pioneer in this, uh, in this new art of the terrorism in the age of television. Mm -hmm. uh, the Irish and the Basques and others are his disciples. Now, the question is, was this a step towards getting a peace process, as it had been in some earlier phases of other movements, which could also be designated as terrorist? Or was, he, was it a step towards the ultimate objective of the destruction of Israel? Now, a point which I heard frequently made in Arab countries at the time was about the Israeli withdrawal from Lebanon. The, as you know, one of Barak's actions was the withdrawal of Israeli forces from Lebanon. There was considerable pressure within Israel to do that yes. because so many Israeli exactly. young men and women had lost their there lives. There was considerable pressure in Israel to withdraw from Lebanon. And I will tell you that I think that the withdrawal from Lebanon was long overdue. I think that in 82 there was justification for going into Lebanon. South Lebanon had become a base for terrorist activities in Israel and elsewhere. But I think that having done that, they should have got out immediately. I think it was a great mistake to stay in Lebanon. However, having said that, I think it was also a great mistake to leave Lebanon the way they did. They left it precipitately, leaving arms and ammunition behind, and worse still, abandoning their Lebanese allies and supporters who were quite numerous. And leaving this operative idea that we, as Bola, have driven the Israelis Exactly. Out. What I heard again and again is Hezbollah have shown us how to do it. The Israelis are like their American protectors. They have become soft and pampered. They can't take it. Hit them and they'll run. And I had the same litany. The Americans, Vietnam, the Marines in Beirut, Somalia, hit them, they'll run. The Israelis are the same. And this assumption, one must admit, had a certain plausibility. A generous offer, if it was that, and a precipitous withdrawal from Lebanon that looked more like a flight than a withdrawal. So Arafat's calculation may have been wrong, it obviously was wrong, but it was certainly not absurd. That he could? That by continuing the fight, he could achieve his larger objectives. And that is the reason that even to this day, he has been reluctant to criticize suicide bombers and to well, from make a clear, precise, in Arabic demand yeah, yes. that terrorist activities cease. Well, the terrorist activities, as far as we know, are almost entirely planned or at the very least approved by him. I mean, the stuff that has come to light now and captured documents and so on indicate a quite elaborately organized infrastructure of terrorism and uh, Arafat at the head of it uh, doing what he does best and um, it seems to me like you're prepared to conclude that Sharon is right I, that Arafat is the problem and he has to isolate him and make him irrelevant yes, and see uh, Char Sharon is by no means alone in that I think a lot of people have come to the conclusion that there is no peace with Arafat um, let me put it a different way asking Arafat to give up terrorism would be like asking Tiger Woods to give up golf. <laughs> I mean, this is what he knows best, this is what he does best, and it has brought him fame and fortune. He is now a great international figure. Um, if the peace process succeeds, he would become the tin pot dictator of a mini-state. But, but this His choice is understandable. Yeah, in, <laughs> it, it, but are you not suggesting that his dream of establishing a Palestinian state is a hypocritical no, his illusion. dream of establishing a Palestinian state is genuine. It's just a question of but, what he uh, means by a Palestinian exactly. state and what room there is for Israel within in, his No, in dream. the ultimate program there is no room for, for Israel. And you, there's no question in your mind that you think that within Arafat's mind, 
that is the reality. Whatever short-term compromises there mm -hmm. might be, there in are the steps end, on the way. there are steps on the way. I have regretfully, I would even say painfully, come to this conclusion. When did you do Having that? watched this during the last few months. Have you really? Yeah. Um, the, the business of the suicide bombers, I think, was what really turned the thing. I began to doubt him when he rejected Barak's offer and started the insurrection. That was already suspect. Then all this talk about the Hezbollah have shown us the way. Then the mounting wave of terrorist activities culminating in the suicide bombers. Um, I think the, the evidence even before the captured documents that the Israelis have is incontrovertible. And I strongly suspect that in the most recent phase, as I said before, that the inspiration comes from the two countries who see themselves most directly and immediately threatened by the war against terrorism. And this has been very successful in confusing the issue. So the conclusion you have reached is Arafat in the last several months, Arafat does not want peace. No. Uh, only as a short-term uh, step if he in fact gives voice to that idea. Yes. And secondly, that his current initiatives are fueled by Iraqis and Iranians. Yes. Uh, the first point, I think that... In order to now, deflect from the right. war against terrorism, which yes. may result in the end of their dreams of nuclear capacity. Right. How's the student doing? Very well indeed. I congratulate <laughs> you. You get an alpha. <laughs> I don't mean it to say that, though, but let me just say this. I had not mean to pat myself on the back, but I, I'm, I'm just curious as to this notion. I've had people here on this program leave and go into the green room and say to me, I've been told by high-ranking Israeli intelligence officials that Arafat was not behind the beginnings of Intifada, Intifada II, that that insurrection was not, they have said to me, not fueled by, not begun by Arafat. Well, I can't quarrel with people who are not here. But, I know, I understand that. And, but, but, uh, but, but, you, um, but you can assert that you do not believe that to be I true, not, and, and that your evidence that. and your conversations lead you to exactly the opposite uh, consensus. There is, uh, one must remember one thing. The Palestinian Authority is not an open democracy. It is a tightly controlled authoritarian state, like most of the other states in the region. And I don't think anything happens without Arafat's approval. Even if he didn't originate himself, he has to approve it. The idea that he can't control this or can't control that, I find unconvincing. In other words, even though Hamas leaders will say, no matter what he says, we're going to continue suicide bombers, you believe that not to be true. That if, in fact, he used whatever might he had and whatever powers that he had, he could, in fact, stop them, which is obviously well, the prevailing the view in, within the Israeli government. Well, the captured documents show. now show that. I mean, they show a structure of preparing suicide bombers, training them, equipping them with factories producing the, uh, not factories, let's say workshops, producing the instruments that they need and so on and so forth. I mean, that is now documented. And uh, it fits with the rest of what we know. Okay, back to my point about Sharon. So you believe that if this turns out to be true, and it is true, and, and, and if you premise what you've just said, then Sharon is on the right track. Get well, away from the idea that the only road to peace with the Palestinians is through Arafat. Well, I would agree with Sharon on this particular point, that Arafat is not and is never likely to be a peace partner, and that uh, Arafat should be dealing with Arafat, Arafat should be seen as part of the war against terrorism. But what do you say to all but, those... Uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. But there, there's more to it than that. I mean, I can see what um, Arafat's tactics are. I can't see what his strategy is, um, what his long-term objective is. I mean... Well, you just sort of said his long-term objective is to be a perennial, a, a permanent... Uh, no, did I say Arafat? I meant Sharon. Okay, I'm, sorry. Sorry. I'm sorry. That was a slip of the tongue. Okay, so... I mean, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, by the way, apropos of that, there was a very interesting remark uh, made by an Egyptian, uh, somewhat eminent Egyptian, um, I'm trying to remember his name, but it's no. anyway, he's a well-known writer right. in Egypt. Okay. He was asked, and I heard this on the radio, he was asked, what is the difference between Sadat's peace process and the peace process of Arafat now? And he said, well, the difference is this, he said, for Sadat, war was a tactic, war, making the war in 73. He said, for Sadat, war was a tactic, peace was a strategy. For Arafat and his people, peace is a tactic, war is a strategy.
Mm. That's a, a rather brilliantly formulated, I would say, from an Egyptian observer uh, on the radio. Well, that's that was before the current crisis broke. I don't think he would dare to say it now. Assuming what, following you through that very interesting history, uh, and the, the development of suicide bombers as a tactic, mm -hmm. you know, does it pretend something terrible for the future of the Middle East? Yes, it does. First of all, I, th I think I can say quite definitely that suicide is contrary to Islamic rules and norms. According to, uh, I would say, the unanimous opinion of the classical Islamic jurists and theologians, suicide is a major sin uh, to be punished with eternal damnation. The damnation to take the form of the endless repetition of the act of suicide. Killing yourself after time, after time, after time, after time. time. Yes, time after. This is how it is written. Now, it is one thing to throw yourself to certain death at the hands of an overwhelmingly superior enemy. That is all right. But to die by your own hand is suicide. And there are even ancient traditions and texts to that effect. There is what's called a Hadith Qudsi. That is a tradition of the Prophet directly quoting God. Then um, why hasn't strong and powerful and members of the Islamic community who know that mm -hmm. step forward to say this voice and this yeah. authority should be heard? Well, they did for a while, but uh, th there was this new a against this, Osama. Yes, there was this new interpretation, according to which suicide is permissible if you take a sufficient number of the enemy with you. Now, this has absolutely no justification, whatever, in Muslim scripture, tradition, or law. This is a new interpretation from the late 20th century, which has got more and more support among people. It is unfortunately true. Um, but I would say, after all, I'm not a Muslim, and I certainly couldn't mm. give any kind of ruling. All I can say is that according to the traditional rules and traditions, the, 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 the texts, suicide is an abomination in the eyes of Muslims. Um, there is a, a, an example of uh, uh, such a text. A man who was mortally wounded in the Holy War was dying on the battlefield. And to end his misery, to shorten his pain, he killed himself with his own sword. And God said, my servant has preempted me. He is denied paradise. He will go to hell. Because it's my it's it my God, role. It my is God's role. role. God decides when you die, not you yourself. And um, that has been the general view. Now, this is something new. And the suicide bomber is a new and very dangerous development. Dangerous because? Because, well, you can see already what it has accomplished in the last few weeks and uh, in the last few months, because there's the, uh, the American case, too. Some say it has... In it's not mine. Uh, some say it has given the Palestinians and others um, almost a sense of empowerment. Yes, I think that's true. <clears throat> it has obviously struck terror, which is obvious, which is what terrorists are for. I mean, that's what the word means. Mm. A terrorist is one who strikes to strike terror in the enemy. And uh, in, that respect, in that respect, it has been very effective. Do you but think it is counterproductive in the long run. But it will. Uh, but is the activities of Sharon and the Israeli forces counterproductive at all in terms of what they have done? There was today in the report that that I think it was Foreign Minister Jack Straw of Britain criticizing the Israelis, saying, you know, there is a feeling that they have gone too far. That may be. I mean, this is a question of uh, the day-to-day -day news, which I I, I know more do than not. Anyone. Well, they'd like a little time to consider it. Um, I think, as I said before, I think Sharon is absolutely right in saying that Arafat is not a peace partner, but part of the war against terrorism. Now, in his methods, his further plans, I'm simply not in a position but to comment. But shouldn't there be a demand? One way or the other. Okay, but shouldn't there be some kind of demand to say exactly what is the strategy here and what is the long run goal and how do you plan to accomplish it? Yes, and I how long is it going to take you to do I, that? I think and that would be a good idea, but my own opinion, for what it's yeah. worth, is that this is not a local question, not a question limited to Palestine. Uh, it is, and on this point, I think President Bush was absolutely right, the axis of evil. 
There is no doubt about their involvement. You remember the story of that shipload of arms from Iran right. that was intercepted. Uh, Saddam has raised the price for suicide bombers from $10,000 to $25,000 per family. Why suddenly? Um, and one can see the obvious interest of these two in deflecting the war. And in this, as I said, they have been extremely successful. Now, how do we get out of this? Well, it seems to me that there will be no improvement until there is a regime change. And here again, I find myself in agreement with the president, or what I thought until recently were the views of the president, <laughs> namely that the first priority is to get rid of the axis of evil. When that happens, I'm sure there would be dramatic changes. Now, but but in, you're, you are saying that if there was no regime in Iraq, with the views that it holds, and no regime, in, there are two regimes in mm -hmm. Iran, some will argue, and as you well know, if there was not the attitude of the most extreme elements well, in, uh, in Iran, that there would be no Palestinian uprising. No, I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is this, that had it not been for the interference of these two, who have been the sponsors, the sponsors and supporters of Hezbollah and Hamas, the suicide bombers and so on. I mean, they have been running the show. And uh, if that is ended, then I think the situation among the Palestinians would change dramatically. Um, remember, as I said before, this is an autocracy. This is not a democratic or an open society. Um, and it takes its line from the top, and the top takes its line from those other places. If that external factor could be eliminated, I have no doubt at all that there are reasonable, sensible people within the Palestinian community who would be willing to sit down and talk uh, and uh, work out some sort of compromise between a Palestinian state and Israel. There are a number of things which would have to be settled. There's the question of borders. Uh, that, I think, could, could be negotiated by reasonable men mm. sitting at a table. There's the question of Jerusalem, which is somewhat more ticklish. Yeah, but possible. But even I mean, we that already is know possible. that's possible. Yes. Um, there's the question of the return right. of the refugees. That is obviously impossible. That yeah, would... but some symbolism, some exactly. symbolic but, act could get I around mean, that. All those things I seem mean, to be... If you get someone on the Palestinian side who is willing to talk in terms of a permanent settlement, Israel and Jordan side by side, then I think... Um, Israel and Jordan side by sorry, side. Israel, Israel and the Palestinians Israel side by side. Yeah. The, the, I was anticipating the next thing I want to say. Okay, go ahead. May I just say that? Um, there was a suggestion which came from a Palestinian some years ago who said that the solution is a Middle Eastern Benelux. Israel, the Palestinian state, and Jordan, corresponding to Belgium, Luxembourg, and the Netherlands. What do you think of that idea? As, uh, as a sort of... Uh, Customs Union. As a, as a, as a, yeah, it's a kind I think, of... I think it's an excellent idea. I think it's a really good idea. And if they could get together politically, I think this could work very well. Now, there are people among the Palestinians, people that I know and people that I've talked with, who are reasonable men. Uh, they didn't like the idea of having Israel there. They didn't want it in the first place. But they realized that by fighting Israel for 50 years, they made Israel bigger and stronger than it ever would have been had they accepted it in the first yeah. place. And they realize that it's time to um, accept the, the facts of so, life. Accept Israel and seek an alternative a relationship that might be productive like what you just exactly. described. Uh, there are people who think like that and talk like that. I'm not going to endanger their lives by naming them. And, and are they an increasing minority is the appropriate question, too. Uh, one has no way of measuring this. But I am reasonably sure, I couldn't put it more strongly than that, that with... Now, of course, things have got so bad that there is really widespread hostility and rage. One would need time for that to settle down. But Generations? Um, no, I don't think so. Moods change much more rapidly in the Middle East than that. I think it is possible. One needs, first of all, some sort of ceasefire um, and uh, a beginning of dialogue. But uh, this is not going to happen as long as Arafat is their leader. It is not going to happen as long as the extremists are being encouraged, armed, equipped, and paid what could, from uh, outside. What could bring the end of Arafat as the leader of the Palestinians? The emergence of an alternative leadership. And that can never happen. That can never happen unless the Egyptians and the Saudis and others are on board within the Arab community, can it? Which they won't, of course. So where are we? 
because you remember these are countries with leaders who are for the most part very unpopular at home and only manage to maintain themselves by force. You have this paradox in the Middle Eastern region of countries with pro-American governments and therefore anti-American populations yes. because they regard America as responsible for foisting these rulers on them and maintaining them by what you might call the Central American method. Yes. And then you have countries like Iraq and Iran with bitterly anti-American rulers where people therefore look to America as liberators. You remember the scenes of rejoicing in Afghanistan. I've been told by well, Iranian... In, 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 okay, no, sorry. Yeah. Uh, I've been told by Iranian friends that that would look like a funeral compared with the rejoicing in Iran if America would step in and help them get rid of their government. Having said all of that, uh, is the Saudi initiative a possible... It began to vehicle. look that way, but then they muddied the waters. I mean, well, there was, one was uncertain from the start whether this initiative was really a plan or just a ploy uh, to make them look good and to put the Israelis in the wrong again. It had this going for it. Uh, one, it was, in fact, land for peace. Yes. More than that, it was normalization of relations. Yes. Norm beyond that, it had some of the prospects of what you just said, right. this kind of right. Benelux right. thing between yes. Israel, yes. the Palestinians, and right. the Jordanians, uh, with the support of countries that didn't have a relationship with Israel, right. like the Saudis, yes. like the... Right. Uh, my first impressions of that were very positive. It seemed to be a step in the right direction. But since then, the, the waters have been muddied. The word normalization has been reinterpreted in a number of different ways. And uh, the question of the return of the refugees has been brought back full force. And that, of course, is a deal breaker, quite obviously, and they know that. Um, I wouldn't dismiss the Saudi initiative. But uh, at the moment, obviously, with what's going on now, it's but, not on the agenda. But the most interesting thing, it's the only thing out there. Yes. It's there the is no thing. Oslo. No, no, Oslo is dead. And the other interesting thing, as you well know, is that the thing that we were talking about with respect to Barack and, and where, where there was not the preparation for Camp David and then Taba that led, whereas there was in, at Camp David with Sadat, there was preparation. Mm -hmm. At Camp David with Arafat and Clinton, Yes. And Barack, there was no preparation, or yes. not sufficient preparation. Not sufficient, I would say, yes. But the structure that was on the table that did not precipitate the counteroffer from Arafat may very well end, be the end place where everybody's going to end up. Yes, I think it was a very reasonable offer. Um, did you say that at the time? Yes. I was in favor of Oslo at the time. I have since regretfully come to the conclusion that Oslo was a mistake. Why? Well, because of what happened. It went disastrously wrong. Well, but did it have to go disastrously no, wrong? it didn't have to go wrong. Oh, I don't mean it was, it was a mistake to get, to get into it from the beginning. But uh, I think that the idea of um, bringing Arafat back from Tunis to the, the Palestine territories and installing him as ruler, I think that was a mistake. He is what he is. Um, one interesting detail, I was told that in one place when the Israelis went into an Arab quarter, started destroying the houses and the rest. One of the people screamed at them, you brought that man back from Tunis and now you're doing this to us. I thought that was very interesting. Palestinians will email me tomorrow and say, does Professor Lewis simply believe all the problems in the Middle East lie at the hand of Yasser Arafat and whoever may be supporting him in Iran or Iraq? And does he not give some lies some of the credit at the hands of Israelis. Of course. No, I'm mean, some, some of the blame, not credit. I, I, well, it comes to the same yeah, thing. Exactly. <laughs> and no, of course not. I mean, obviously, the Israelis have made a great number of very serious mistakes, one of the worst of which is this whole business of the settlements. I mean, I pointed out before that relations were quite friendly until 77. And that came from guess who? Sharon. No, no. The, the that was before he was Sharon. in charge of the beginning. That was before Sharon. That was big. I don't mean in government, but, but did Sharon have a role in some of those governments oh, he in had terms a role of in being the of it, person who most of all was the yeah. initiator of settlements because he believed mm. that Israel needed yeah. for the security a kind of buffer? I wouldn't know the precise apportionment of responsibility. <laughs> and I don't Israel. want to be the one to contradict but, you, uh, the but, professor. Uh, no, but yeah. I, I don't know. But obviously this, 
there was this policy of settlements. Yeah. And that was a disaster from, from, the, from your from judgment. From 77 onwards. And it's still an issue I for think Palestinians. I think that it is, uh, it is a serious issue, quite obviously. I mean, some settlements which are very near to the old border and are really expansion of existing urban areas, something else. But having Israeli settlements near Nablus or near Gaza uh, seems to me to be non dangerous nonsense. What I find interesting about what you have said this evening for this hour of conversation with me is that you believe, for example, that the issue of settlement can be dealt with <coughs> because everybody knows in the end it can only be symbolic because the demographics prevent it from being anything else. <laughs> Right. Well, I, so therefore, the end game is not as difficult as we often believe. And what is more difficult is getting there and having people who believe they want to be there. Exactly. I believe that if you could get <coughs> Israelis and Palestinians to sit down in good faith, preferably without anyone else there, just just uh. these. And, Just and, and, with the, and with the will to reach the point. Exactly. With the will to reach a peace, which means the acceptance by the Israelis that they will have to withdraw from the greater part of the territories that they occupied, or, and uh, on the part of the Palestinians, that they must accept Israel as a permanent fact. Um, Sharon has said that he is prepared to make painful sacrifices, but as far as I know, he hasn't specified and that's part of the problem. Um, I assume that he's referring to some of the settlements, uh, some of which are quite obviously untenable. But in order for that to happen, there has to be a new leadership on the Palestinian side who think in different terms, in terms of peace. And in order to get a new leadership on the Palestinian side, you will also need to have a change in the regional situation, because the present regional situation is certainly not conducive to that. And I personally very much like the, uh, the idea which I quoted to you from a Palestinian of a Benelux. Mm. Uh, when he said this to me, he said the, the three linked together in a customs union like Benelux, I said to him, you mean that the Palestinian state would be the Luxembourg? And he said, yes. And I said, I can't quite see Mr. Arafat in the role of the Grand Duchess. <laughs> On that. Uh, I leave you with this one last note, it seems to me. You are saying that the President of the United States should not forget his original objective with respect to the war against terrorism I think and not be deflected by mm -hmm. whatever the demands are of the Middle East and yes. whatever resistance he is finding among yes. Arab countries. I think that is of crucial importance, much more important than the whole Palestine question for one simple reason. Saddam Hussein is a man consumed by the desire for vengeance for what he sees as the wrongs inflicted on him. He is working very, very hard to get weapons of mass destruction. We know that from a variety of sources, in particular a number of defectors who came and provided very detailed information about what he's doing and how far he's got. The Iranians are also working on this, though I think that they are, how shall I put it, less fanatical than he is. I don't have the slightest doubt that when he gets them, he will use them. Uh, per perhaps in the Middle East, perhaps in the United States. And I think, therefore, the removal of that regime is the, uh, the most urgent priority. And we have the machinery for doing it. There is an Iraqi opposition movement, the Iraqi National Congress, uh, led by Ahmad Chalabi. There is a quarter of the country in the north of Iraq which is not under Saddam's control. That is far more than the Northern Alliance in Afghanistan ever had before they got started. So there is a real possibility, and there are people, Iraqis, who can do it, and there is, I feel, in Iraq, uh, a, a number of people who are capable of creating and running a democracy. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to have you here. If you can, thanks. Bernard Lewis, What Went Wrong, Western Impact and Middle Eastern Response, a book we have talked about before. I am always pleased to have him at this table. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time.